I'm Karen Shaneman. I'm one of the new class of members that joined several months ago, and I'm enjoying meeting all the wonderful and fabulous people that are part of this congregation. And I'm enjoying church for the first time in my long life. Thanks to you all and to Reverend Jen, who's really cool. <laughs> Our congregational mission is one of spiritual transformation, of work for a more just and equitable world, and of education and engagement for people of all ages. We welcome you, whether it's your first time with us, or you've been with us for weeks or months or even years. We welcome you in person, and we welcome you online. We now light the chalice, the symbol of our living faith. If you're joining us online, you may wish to light a candle or chalice of your own. I invite you to hear today's chalice lighting words, an excerpt from Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings by Joy Harjo. And use what you learn to resolve your own conflicts and to mediate others' conflicts. And here are her words. When we made it back home, back over those curved roads that wind through the city of peace, we stopped at the doorway of dusk as it opened to our homelands. We gave thanks for the story, for all parts of the story, because it was by the light of those challenges we knew ourselves. We asked for forgiveness. We laid down our burdens next to each other. I'd like to invite any child of any age, temperament, type, kind, sort, anyone who feels like they would prefer to sit on the floor during this part up here up front with me if you would like to. You do not have to. Look at my RE committee members. They are amazing. <laughs> 
I have a story today that is not my story or my poem. It is a Shel Silverstein classic from his collection, Where the Sidewalk Ends. I have had this book since I was um, maybe five. So this is old. Um, so today's story you may be familiar with, and there's not a lot of pictures, so I'm going to show you right away. It's called Hector the Collector. Hector, the collector, collected bits of string, collected dolls with broken heads and rusty bells that wouldn't ring, picked pieces out of picture puzzles, bent up nails and ice cream sticks, twists of wires, worn out tires, paper bags and broken bricks, old chipped vases, half shoelaces, Gatlin guns that wouldn't shoot, leaky boats that wouldn't float, and stopped up horns that wouldn't toot. Butter knives that had no handles, copper keys that fit no locks, rings that were too small for fingers, dried up leaves and patched up socks. Worn out belts that had no buckles, electric trains that had no tracks, airplane models, broken bottles, three-legged chairs and cups with cracks. Hector the collector loved these things with all his soul loved them more than shining diamonds, loved them more than glistening gold. Hector called to all the people, come and share my treasure trunk. And all the silly, sightless people came and looked and called it junk. Have you ever had anything that was important to you? that someone else didn't understand the importance of it when they saw it? Okay, so yes, a broken, so a truck that looked broken to your parents that you still liked playing with, right? It was broken, but you still liked to play with it. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so sometimes you don't know, right, do you? You don't know what something means to someone unless you ask. You just are, you can never be sure or unless they volunteer that information to you. And if somebody tells you that something is important to them, maybe think about not calling it junk no matter what it looks like to them. So thanks for sharing that today. And just think about what we tell ourselves when we call things by names or we say that they are important. And now we can sing our kids out to class. reading for today <clears throat> is called The Gates of Hope by Reverend Victoria Safford. Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, not the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges People cannot hear us there. They cannot pass through. Nor the cheerful, flimsy, gonna be all right gate, but a different, sometimes lonely place, the place of truth telling. About your own soul first and all its condition, 
the place of resistance and defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is and as it could be, as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle but the joy of the struggle. And we stand there beckoning and calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so how many of us here are collectors? Maybe not exactly the kind of collector that Hector was, but do you have a special set or type of item that you cherish, that you display, you keep an eye out for when you're in the shops to see if you might have an addition or two? People have collections? Kind of, maybe. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a collector. I've always loved cats and I had a couple of stuffed cats and when my grandmother gave me a small ceramic cat, I decided I would collect those too. One definition I've heard to distinguish between a collection and a bunch of related stuff is having an organizational method and or a method of display. My little group of cat figurines had neither. And eventually I realized I was just packing them into boxes and leaving them unopened for years and moves as I grew older at a time and I made the choice to let them go. Today's story was one particular example of the old saying, one person's trash is another person's treasure. When we realize we have gathered items together, it does matter what we call it. Is it our collection that we will lovingly curate and clean and store and display and explain? Or is it just stuff we have because it struck our fancy at a certain place or time? It's okay which one it is. It's important to know. In today's reading, thank you again, Karen, we hear these words from the Reverend Victoria Safford. The place of truth telling about your own soul first and its condition, the place of resistance and defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is and as it could be, as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle but the joy of the struggle. And we stand there beckoning and calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. Truth-telling. It is a kind of storytelling, a kind of truth we tell ourselves when we decide that our stuff is actually a collection, or that our collection is actually stuff. In point of fact, objects are always objects. It is the name we give them that helps us define them both for ourselves and for others. What are the stories we tell about ourselves? What are the stories we tell about our world, our society? What are the stories that others in our society are telling? How often do we choose to listen to stories that are different from our own? Tomorrow marks the federal holiday of Columbus Day. It also marks Indigenous Peoples Day. Last year, President Biden officially declared the 11th of October as Indigenous Peoples Day, but that was just for 2021. It was not an establishment of a new federal holiday. I had to look that up to reassure myself that I was not getting that wrong. On the website for the 2022 Farmer's Almanac, I read this very clarifying sentence, quote, while Indigenous Peoples Day remains a non-federal holiday, it is federally recognized as a national holiday. What? Uh, huh? Talk about naming, not in a clarifying way, non-federal but federally recognized. 
is a mouthful to say it's complicated. And that more than one thing can exist at the same time. It is complicated. And when we think about the stories that we tell and the stories we hear from others, complication will always be present because there is never just a single story. Tonight, at sundown, our Jewish siblings and selves will begin the celebration of Sukkot, an agricultural festival that originally was considered a thanksgiving for the fruit harvest. As I read this morning in one of my daily reflection emails from the rabbi Dana Rutenberg, yes, it's the one with the huts. They are the sukkah, which are the hut-like structures you will see on many lawns of faithful Jewish people at, 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 at uh, temples and synagogues. These structures are built to represent the small uh, temporary dwellings that the, Israel, the Israeli people, the Israelites built when they were in fleeing from Egypt for 40 years in the desert. And the temporary dwelling that we build in modern times, the sukkah, represents the fact that all existence is fragile, and therefore this holiday is a time to appreciate the shelter of our homes and our bodies. For the next seven nights, the expectation is that all meals will be taken in the sukkah, a reminder of our fragile existence. So there are these three narratives that are all alive this weekend. A narrative of exploration and colonization in Columbus Day. In Indigenous Peoples Day, a narrative of truth-telling and acknowledgement of past harms done in the name of that exploration and colonization. A narrative to honor those who have called this land home and called this land sacred before European explorers arrived. And an ancient narrative of celebration and thankfulness to acknowledge the riches we have not just in the harvest, but also in our homes, in ourselves and in our communities. And I'm certain there are other holidays that I don't know about happening this weekend. And for instance, for our neighbors to the north, tomorrow is Thanksgiving in Canada, um, which has its own set of traditions and narratives and counter narratives that are similar but not identical to those of the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. And all these larger narratives do not preclude the significant things happening tomorrow for people all over the world. Tomorrow will be someone's birthday. Tomorrow will be someone's death day. Tomorrow is an anniversary, a reunion, a party, a first sober day. This is not to equivocate us out of the importance of the vital story told by these holidays that we've mentioned. It's to remind us that none of us have heard all the stories. To remind us to approach each story with curiosity, not certainty. In our chalice lighting today, we heard but a small portion, in fact, the very end, of Joy Harjo's long poem, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, from the book of the same name. Joy Harjo is a well-loved and well-respected poet who served three terms as the Poet Laureate of the United States and who is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Harjo's work often engages beautifully with the multiple narratives, the multiple truths which are contained within that complicated container we name the United States of America. The holy beings in Harjo's poems are humans all of us, and in fact all the beings we encounter as well. The conflict is the deepest in the soil of our nation. Who are we? If we cannot be honest about all of the stories of who we are, then our answer is not complete. At the very end of her long poem, she asks us not just to make space, but to give thanks. We give thanks for the story, for all parts of the story, because it was by the light of those challenges we knew ourselves. We asked for forgiveness. We laid down our burdens next to each other. When we approach the stories we tell and the stories we hear with curiosity, 
then we can think more deeply even about the challenging parts of the story. We can think of them without defensiveness, without judgment for ourselves or others. We can think of them with hope. In her book, After the Good News, Progressive Faith Beyond Optimism, the Reverend Nancy MacDonald Ladd invites us to consider a world where we cultivate hope without certainty, and where we consider hope even as we learn more and more complicated stories about the reality of the world. She writes, just because we are honest does not mean we cannot be hopeful. As Vaclav Havel famously articulated, hope is not just another version of optimism. Optimism tells a preordained narrative. It is an assertion that the scales have already been tipped toward triumph. Hope is different. Like faith, hope is the exact opposite of certainty. It does not presume an outcome for good or for ill. It lies in the waiting moment when the tug from both directions is not yet fully resolved and when a great many things are still possible. It is the possibility, not the inevitability, of a better way. In the introduction to her book, Reverend Ladd shares that she writes her sermons in view of a Peanuts cartoon that she pasted on the wall years before. It's a Peanuts cartoon that I remember fondly, and I wrote here, I may have well printed out a copy to display in my own office, which I actually haven't done yet, but I'm gonna. In this Peanuts cartoon, for those of you not familiar, Peanuts is a strip that ran, is a comic strip that ran for like 50 years from the early, late 50s until 2001 when Charles Schultz retired. Charlie Brown, hapless young boy, and his dog Snoopy, who's smarter than every human in the place. In the first panel, Charlie, walks up, Charlie Brown walks up to Snoopy, who's sitting on his doghouse working diligently on his typewriter. I hear you're writing a book on theology, Charlie Brown says. I hope you have a good title. Snoopy's reply in his perpetual thought bubble is, I have the perfect title. And in the final frame, we see that he has typed, Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? We are, you know. I am. Every day, we're wrong. And when we embrace that with hope, the possibility, not the certainty, not the inevitability of better things to come, when we embrace it with curiosity, we may be gifted with treasure beyond compare. The possibility not the inevitability of a better way. Gratitude for all of the parts of the story, all the multitude of stories, especially the hard ones. A sense that we are indeed holy beings. Today's responsive hymn is a reminder that we are all beautiful, whole, and holy beings. I invite you to please rise in body or in spirit to join in hymn number 1053 in the Teal Hymnal, How Could Anyone?
Please join us now in extinguishing our chalice and your home chalices if you have lit them with these words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We come to the end of our worship and the beginning of our service out in the week. Every time you hear someone's story, remind yourself that is a holy being telling me their truth. Leave space in your hearts for all the complicated narratives that entwine and enrich our lives. So may it be. Don't poison the future away.